This is Duke University. We're really fortunate in having Paul Joskow here. Um, I, he, as you know, is the president of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, uh, which is one of the um, uh, large foundations that focuses on engineering, um, on science, um, uh, and, uh, and has pioneered a number of really fascinating initiatives over the course of the history of that foundation. Um, it, we have a special, uh, the special place in, uh, in our hearts for uh, the Sloan Foundation because uh, it was the first foundation actually that gave the Sanford, then Sanford Institute, a grant to start our program, uh, our joint program in engineering and public policy. This is in 1971 and it was, it paid for the salaries for part of our uh, core faculty uh, as we began to build this, this program. Uh, so, and it, it was, we have, we have had, I have to say, we've had a number of students over the years who've majored, joint majored in public policy and engineering. Uh, not as many recently, but, um, but they, they're still there. Um, one of the recent young trustees for Duke, Ben Abram, was a joint major in, um, in engineering and public policy. In any event, um, uh, Paul was many years, he got his PhD uh, from Yale, uh, went to work then at MIT and has been on the MIT faculty um, for ever since then until he is now emeritus until he was selected uh, as the president of the Sloan Foundation. The Sloan Foundation is, uh, is really quite an interesting foundation uh, in, in its focus. Uh, I think the last time I checked, they have a postdoc program for economists, right? Uh, and there are a lot of economists who have Nobel Prizes <laughs> who are associated with the Alfred P. Sloan <coughs> Foundation, they have very good taste in picking their PhD econom economics postdocs. Um, but it's, it's, it's when, when I think of the world of foundations and I think of the foundations that are concentrating on science, technology, and engineering, those things, the Sloan Foundation really is at the top of the list. Uh, and it's one that has stayed with it. Uh, it's doing exactly what, um, what Alfred P. Sloan said that he wanted the foundation to do. Um, uh, the, in, in its focus on science, advancing science, public understanding of science, uh, but it's had the, 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 the ability to stay focused on what he intended to do while at the same time evolving with the times. And so while the public understanding of science program started out as a program to finance the publication of books, and some of our scholars here at Duke have written uh, books under, them, uh, under, under that rubric, They've now actually moved to the point where they've, they've been invested in Broadway shows, uh, I think in television shows, all of them dealing with science. Walk in the Woods is a good example of one of the shows that they financed. So uh, it, it has a really remarkable record and it's a great pleasure to have Paul here. Uh, I think Paul is the first president of the foundation whom, um, whom we've had the honor of having visit uh, and I hope that um, you'll come often. Oh, thank you. I was trying to, I know Joan, Joel a long time. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I didn't know what to call this talk because I don't give talks about foundations, but Joel asked me to. When I give talks, I usually give talks about economics because I'm still an economist. But it was a, uh, an opportunity for me to reflect on uh, my experience moving from a, an academic career to running a, what's now a moderate-sized uh, uh, foundation. And uh, after the uh, camera's off, you can ask me why I did it. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I, I've been, I, I started on January 1st, 2008, and it's now been almost seven years, so I have some perspective on it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and I'd like to talk about that, first about the foundation, and then about coming in and, and, and taking over uh, running the foundation, some of the challenges that uh, I faced and, and how I, uh, I went about, uh, I went about uh, handling them. Uh, and uh, I hope in the Q&A period we can maybe get into some of those, uh, uh, some of the more difficult challenges in, uh, in, in, somewhat, in somewhat more detail. So I'll just, so I'm a new, a new president, but I'm not so new anymore. Uh, it's an old foundation, uh, 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 but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I think the, the, the challenges are, to me anyway, have been uh, in many ways unexpected. So let me start just uh, saying a few things about 
uh, about the Sloan Foundation. It was, it was created by Alfred P. Sloan in uh, 1934. Uh, his wealth came from uh, General Motors. Uh, he was the chairman of General Motors uh, for many, many years. Uh, he was born in, in Brooklyn. He, he had a terrible Brooklyn accent. We've found a, a 1950s uh, NBC interview with him, and it uh, uh, sounds like uh, some of my relatives who were, grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, he went to MIT uh, in electrical engineering and, and uh, had a long relationship with MIT in his uh, philanthropic work. Uh, uh, he, he started the Sloan Kettering uh, Institute for Cancer Research in, uh, in New York uh, and also the MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, those were, that and, and his foundation were his three, uh, his three uh, uh, largest philanthropic endeavors. Uh, but uh, and the foundation has thrown off uh, uh, many, many others over time. Uh, the foundation has just under $2 billion in assets now. Uh, uh, we're somewhere between a small foundation and a big foundation, uh, but uh, the, the, most of the, the foundations that we, we play with in one way or another are, are large foundations, and we're about the size of the Knight Foundation and the Doris Duke Foundation, uh, at the lower end of the larger foundations, but uh, uh, we when compared to the Gates Foundation, which gives away $4 billion a year, uh, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're tiny. Did you want to project those points up on there? Oh, yeah, I, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. You got it. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> uh, so we, we, last year we, we gave uh, about $82 million in, in that's cash uh, in grants. Uh, our management expenses were about $10 million. Uh, and we give away now uh, the five-year average is five percent of the uh, of the value of the uh, of, of the endowment. We have a staff of thirty people, including me and the receptionist. Uh, and the foundation's always been located in New York. This may surprise you. Alfred P. Sloan did not live in Detroit. Uh, he lived in New York. <laughs> he lived on Fifth Avenue. Uh, uh, this is true. Of, the, on the economic history of this is kind of interesting. There, there are a lot of the wealthy people then who had businesses all over the country lived in New York and spent a lot of time in New York because that's where the money was. Uh, that's where you had to go for financing uh, uh, to, to the banks, to Wall Street, and so on. There was a GM building, it's still called the GM building in New York, which was basically the fi financial headquarters for GM uh, uh, for many, many, for many, many years. Okay, the mission of the foundation, I, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, uh, and I'll come back to, to how we've refined it. The Sloan Foundation makes grants primarily to support original research and broad-based education related to science, technology, economic performance, and the quality of, of American life. In each of our grant programs, we seek proposals for original projects led by outstanding individuals or team, teams. We're interested in projects that have a high expected return to society and for which funding from the private sector, government, or other foundations is not yet widely available. So our, our grant making attempts to be catalytic. Uh, many of our programs uh, uh, involve, involve financing not just by us, but by, uh, by other nonprofits, uh, by government agencies, and, and so on. And we try to get into things before they're, uh, before they're to, to seed them, to get them started. Uh, and then, uh, and then to, uh, to withdraw. In terms of our current programs, uh, we have a basic science technology, basically a science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics uh, research program. The oldest part of it is the Sloan Research Fellows, which uh, uh, Joel just mentioned. Uh, we give 126 uh, uh, fellowships each year. Uh, to distinguished assistant professors who have, uh, who have PhDs. Uh, uh, that's expanded over time. Uh, about 45 of those people now went on to win Nobel Prizes, 55 National Medal of Science, and uh, uh, I think we have a pretty good record uh, in, in identifying outstanding people. And the, the winner of the Nobel Prize this year, a, a Frenchman, Jean Tirole, uh, was, all, was a Sloan Research Fellowship, and he's on our, 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 our uh, webpage uh, uh, this week. 
Uh, we have a, a program called the Deep Carbon Observatory that involves uh, uh, geoscientists from all over the world studying uh, uh, carbon in the earth. Uh, uh, it includes uh, uh, esoteric topics in uh, extreme physics and chemistry. Uh, it includes the study of uh, uh, fluxes, which I've learned as volcanoes, uh, uh, more or less, uh, and other leakages of, of carbon and methane from the earth. It has a deep energy program uh, and an origins of life uh, component to it as well. And that program is, uh, uh, is, is basically uh, uh, managed uh, by the Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington. Uh, we have a microbiology of the built environment program that's, that is, is looking at the uh, science of uh, microbes and fungi uh, uh, inside of buildings where we spend about 80% of our time and has been understudied. Uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is, a, is a, an ongoing program uh, which we reevaluate every five years. Uh, it's a, it's a, an astronomy program, but what distinguishes this program from many astronomy programs is it's focused on data collection, data archiving, open access to data, uh, and making data available for research by astrophysicists all over the world. And about 20,000 papers have been written from, uh, from the data there. And as I'll, I'll mention in a moment, uh, we've just renewed that and we're going to be expanding it to include a, uh, a, a facility in, uh, in Chile uh, because uh, uh, to, to get more of the Milky Way and, uh, in the survey, uh, you need a southern exposure. But it's not a billion dollar telescope. It's going to be a, uh, uh, we're using existing, existing technology and it'll, it'll be relatively inexpensive. And then we have a synthetic biology program which is coming to an end. Uh, Joel mentioned our public understanding, it's now called Public Understanding of Science, Technology, and Economics. I, I have to correct one thing. It, the, the contemporary program did start with a books program, but we recently moved uh, three floors and we found a whole lot of stuff that had not been filed carefully, <laughs> uh, including uh, quite a, I found the Alfred P. Sloan's will, I mean, among other things. Uh, but we found uh, cartoons that the Sloan Foundation financed with Warner Brothers. Uh, that uh, they're, they're, they're sort of a little bit deteriorated, but they, they, they basically are teaching people about the evils of the income tax, as far as I can, uh, as far as I can, <laughs> I can tell. Uh, so we have a book program, which is still very lively. We, we finance books on science and technology, uh, six to eight a year. Uh, we have a, an extensive film program, in fact, on, on Thursday, I'm going to the Sloan Film Summit in, in LA. We, we uh, have six film schools where students are, 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 uh, uh, take courses in, in, in science and write science-based scripts. Uh, we support uh, 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 three uh, uh, film, uh, film activities, Sundance, uh, uh, Tribeca, and uh, the Hamptons Film Festival, film festivals where, where new work is exhibited and we give prizes for the best science films. Uh, on TV, we support NOVA, uh, The American Experience, and uh, general PBS documentaries uh, related, to, related to science. We put one together with, uh, uh, with PBS right after the Fukushima uh, uh, meltdown uh, and catastrophe to, to try to get the facts out to the public very quickly, quickly on, uh, on, uh, uh, on public television. On the radio, we support Science Friday, uh, we support Radio Lab, and uh, also the economics reporting on the, uh, on the news hour. Uh, we have a theater program. Uh, we support the Manhattan Theater Company in New York to commission science-based scripts and a, uh, and a uh, uh, fa less fancy theater uh, uh, called the Ensemble Studio Theater that has 99 seats that uh, uh, tries out uh, uh, new science-based plays. The most recent, which I thought was really quite good, was a play about Rosalind Franklin, uh, who was the uh, X-ray crystallographer who uh, 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 Crick and Watson relied upon to uh, identify the structure of DNA and a, a part of our efforts to highlight and promote women in science, uh, which has been underrepresented. Uh, the Sloan Foundation has had, had a long-standing economics program. It, 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 it disappeared for a, a period of years, but uh, Mr. Sloan helped to finance Brookings when it first got started and the National Bureau of Economic Research, and we've, uh, we've recreated that program. 
uh, stimulated in part by the Great Recession. Uh, I started on January 1st, 2008. Uh, interest in behavioral economics and then empirical enablers, sort of big data and its use in, uh, in economics and other social sciences. Uh, we have a program in the aging workforce and working longer, and this basically, people live longer than they used to. Uh, uh, they live healthier lives, at least a fraction of them do, but all of our institutions for involving retirement and uh, uh, many other things were, were developed in the 1930s and the 1960s, and this program looks at, uh, at barriers and opportunities for people to have longer, uh, longer working lives, not just because they need to, but also because they may want to, and I, I think it, that's sort of the focus. Uh, we have a digital information technology program, uh, which is sort of a, both a, a vertical program focusing on the use of digital technology in scholarly communications, data and computational research, uh, but also horizontally uh, to, to make sure that all of our programs are on the frontier and using uh, data, uh, using new computational techniques, using the internet, using social networks, networking, and so on. And as part of that, we also have what we call Universal Access to Knowledge Program. We're one of the earliest supporters of Wikipedia, uh, the Internet Ar Archive, and we've created, and it's still ongoing, the Digital Public Library of America, which will link together the digital collections of libraries all over the world uh, for access uh, by the, by the pub public. Uh, when, we don't know, when we don't know where to put a program or we're trying one out, we call it Selected Issues. Uh, so we have an energy and environment program uh, that focuses on resources and technologies. It's not a program, it's just it's a focus area. It's going to become a program. Uh, really focus on, on technologies, uh, resources, uh, and, and behavior uh, to, to move the country from a, uh, towards a lower carbon uh, footprint economy. Uh, it's not a climate change program, it's an energy program, but it's stimulated by uh, the, uh, the recognition that uh, the U.S. and the rest of the world needs to move towards a, 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 a lower carbon footprint because of climate change. And then we have a New York metropolitan program, a civic program that, that uh, uh, now follows our mission statement. Uh, one difference is uh, uh, that it, we, we don't normally support high school projects, but in New York City we do, we do have a number of uh, high school projects. I started, you get some pleasures out of these jobs. I, I started a, uh, an awards program for uh, uh, outstanding science and math teachers in New York City public high schools. I went to New York City public schools, PS 173, Junior High School 216, Francis Lewis High School, and I thought that, peop that public school teachers were getting a pretty bad rap in, uh, in New York, uh, focusing on the bad ones rather than the good ones. Uh, we've done it now for six years. Last year, one of the winners was uh, a math teacher from the high school I went to. Uh, and at the award ceremony, which we have at Cooper Union, my 11th grade math teacher showed up, which I thought was amazing. My first question to her was, that was 51 years ago, how old were you? <laughs> she, she, <laughs> she was 20. Uh, and uh, I think that program uh, has been very successful, and as I'll say in a moment, we've re I've restructured our New York City program to really focus on our mission statement uh, to do things in science, technology, and, uh, and mathematics. Did you leave out the STEM higher education on purpose? Uh, no. Sorry about that. Uh, so STEM higher education, we have a, a, a fairly large program that focuses on encouraging members of underrepresented groups, uh, African Americans, uh, Latinos and Latinas uh, and Native Americans uh, to get graduate education in STEM fields. Uh, uh, the program is also beginning to support uh, career development for those students uh, and I'm, I've restructured that program and I want to talk a little bit about that in a little while. We've also started uh, to do some support for teaching science to undergraduates in colleges to try to retain more students in, uh, in science and engineering fields. Uh, uh, they have a sort of a 50% drop-off rate from, uh, from what they declare as freshmen to what they end up majoring in. And there's just some uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, research to do in this, uh, in this uh, area, and we've, we've begun to, to enter it. Sorry. So who, who are our largest grantees? Well, 
The largest grantees in the end are faculty, students, and postdocs at U.S. colleges and universities. Uh, we give some money to Canadian universities and, un and universities in other countries, but primarily uh, the money ends up uh, uh, with, with the faculty and students uh, and the postdocs uh, uh, in those universities. Actually, our largest single grantee is probably the, the, the National Action Council for Minorities in, uh, in Engineering because uh, we use them to basically help us run our, uh, our minority uh, PhD program. Uh, public television and public radio uh, in, in the aggregate uh, uh, are probably the second largest group of uh, grantees. The one thing I'll tell you is public radio is really cheap per eyeball or ear compared to public television. I think that's a kind of an issue for television uh, these days because to, I mean, to reach a large audience uh, with Radio Lab or with uh, uh, Science Friday or we have a, we have a theater on radio uh, uh, program in Los Angeles uh, is, is really pretty inexpensive compared to what it costs to do a, an hour of NOVA. Uh, and, uh, and even though NOVA gets uh, a, a, a very large number of people who watch it. Uh, we give money to think tanks like Brookings and the Urban Institute and Re Resources for the Future to, to support our programs. The one thing I'll say about that, and you may want to maybe ask me a little bit more about that later, it's getting harder and harder to find nonpartisan think tanks uh, that are not closely linked to one of the political parties. And uh, we are aggressively nonpartisan. Uh, and uh, uh, for us, it's kind of an issue to make sure if we're, if we're supporting research, we're not just getting the party line that, that uh, uh, people start out asking questions and, and uh, doing research to give us the answers or, uh, or, or, or a range of answers. And then we support a number of uh, what I'll call infrastructure institutions that, that are involved with STEM research and education. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Research Council, the, uh, the AAU, the American Council on Education, and uh, a, number of, a number of others. I added this to our website. It turns out to be very convenient. <laughs> what we don't support, uh, the, if, when you become a foundation president, I've learned that everyone thinks you have a checkbook. and. That people come up to you and you got to hide and put on a disguise. Uh, and uh, uh, we like to make it clear to people so they don't waste their time, what we don't support. So here's just a list of things uh, that we, we don't support. Uh, one I'll hint on is medical research. That might surprise you because, because of the funding of Sloan Kettering. Uh, but uh, Mr. Sloan, before he passed away, felt that A, the We'd given enough money to Sloan Kettering, and B, the government was starting to uh, increase its funding of, of basic research in, in biomedical areas, and that this was an area we could withdraw from. Uh, and with some exceptions, we basically have. Uh, we don't do the humanities. We don't give money to art museums or to, uh, or to uh, operas or symphonies, uh, except related to the public understanding of uh, programs. So we, we supported an opera at the Metropolitan, Museum of, uh, Metropolitan Opera uh, called Dr. Atomic. Uh, it's about the building of the atomic bomb. Uh, it was a John Adams opera. I thought it was pretty good. It didn't last very long, but uh, uh, we did that. And, and uh, of course, we, we have all the, the media that we, uh, that we support, uh, that some of which uh, uh, really try to link the world, to the world of the arts and humanities with science and technology. Uh, we don't make endowments. We don't give buildings. We don't pay for equipment unless it's uh, uh, an integral part of, a, of one of our programs. Uh, we, don't do fund, we don't pay for fundraising drives or fundraising dinners. I put that in our code of conduct because I get invited to a fundraising dinner about three a day. Uh, and uh, uh, that's just not what we, uh, what we do. Uh, we don't support political activities or policy advocacy of any kind except for motherhood and apple pie kinds of things like science is good and education is good. Uh, uh, and, and we try to be aggressively nonpartisan. We don't support 501c4 or other similar uh, 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 entities that, that uh, can devote some of their efforts to, to uh, lobbying and other activities. Uh, and then we don't support K through 12 education, as I said, except uh, in our civic program and our New York, New York program, where we think of this as a, a place to pilot some things and where we, we focus uh, uh, very clearly on uh, on science and mathematics. 
Oops. So who am I? As, as you heard, I was a professor of economics at MIT for 35 years. I'd been a Sloan Foundation grantee in the 1970s. I was, the Sloan Foundation had an economic advisory board, and I was a reviewer during the early 1980s. But I sort of lost uh, contact with the Sloan Foundation uh, uh, around uh, 1985 or 86. Uh, the one thing I'd say about the MIT economics department is it's a relatively small, very collegial, uh, and an outstanding department, uh, and it, it, uh, it had some, some uh, effects on the way I've managed the Sloan Foundation. I was the chair of the MIT economics department for five years. I, I had a research center I was the director of. Of course, I was an academic journal editor. I was also a consultant, and I was a, a corporate and nonprofit organization, boards, uh, probably about five or six over time. Uh, and I would say all of these things have contributed in one way or another to, uh, to, to the, my approach to the challenges I've, uh, I faced. And uh, I'd say in particular, uh, uh, some of them are obvious in terms of the kinds of things we fund, having come from a university. But some are less obvious, having been a corporate director uh, and having had contacts in, in companies turned out to be, uh, to be uh, very helpful. This is not the standard. Uh, a resume for a foundation president. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I, a lot of foundation presidents are former university presidents or provosts. I aggressively avoided being a dean, a provost, a president, or anything. I just didn't want to do that. I was an economist. I took my turn as chair of the economics department, and uh, I really didn't want, to, uh, didn't want to do administration. So in that sense, it's, it's really somewhat peculiar. So what are the challenges that a new president faces? Well, what is the mission for the foundation? Uh, obviously, there's some history there, but uh, uh, as, as, as we were discussing before, sometimes it's hard to identify what the mission is of some foundations, and they, they seem to vary almost randomly. Uh, what kinds of programs do you want to have to, uh, to uh, uh, meet the mission? And when you come in uh, to an existing foundation, what do I think about the existing programs? Uh, uh, what kinds of new programs should we have, if, uh, if any? Uh, how can existing programs be improved uh, if they're, they're not performing up to snuff? There are people issues. How do, you, how do you find the people to match the kinds of programs you have uh, and, and make sure you have the right people? Uh, I must say, when I, took this, when I took this job, I thought it would stop there. This was mostly a thinking kind of a job. And, program development and management, and maybe some people management. I had to do that as a department head, or though not as deeply as it turned out. But this is a small business. Uh, all the things you take for granted when you work for a large university, you have to do yourself. You have to deal with health insurance every November. I'm dealing with it now. And, it's, and New York City is a horrible place to have to deal with health insurance. Uh, I have to deal with the hiring and firing people. We just moved. I mean, I had to hire really? contractors and, de and deal with architects. And, Where did you move to? Uh, three floors down. <laughs> not very far. Same building. Oh, three floors down. Far. Same building. Huh. Uh, and then there are governance and compliance issues. Uh, these are, these are, are organizations for the public benefit. There are IRS rules and uh, basic principles of, of, of governance for these organizations. They're, they're not for profit, and they're supposed to uh, be in, in return for that status, uh, they are supposed to be pursuing uh, efficiently uh, 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 projects and programs that, that, benefit, that benefit the public. And the governance issues uh, were also a surprise to me that I, I had to spend a lot of time dealing with those. So let me first turn to the mission, uh, and I'll speed up here. How do we know what the mission was? And we, we've had a fairly constant mission to, that, that I've uh, The one I read to you, we sort of wrote down finally, but uh, so how do we know what it is? Well, we have a letter Mr. Sloan was asked to write in 1959 of his vision for the foundation. It's a very thoughtful letter, recognizing that times would change, and he didn't want to be too specific. But he was really interested in, 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 in research, uh, in science, uh, in, in technology, in management, in engineering, uh, and, uh, and education, uh, public education, broad-based public education in particular. 
Uh, we found when we moved a, a forward to the first external review of the Sloan Research Fellowship Program, which was done in 1964, where he articulates this vision, the importance of, of, of basic science for the growth of the economy, for the well-being of the, the people, the importance of individual investigators, uh, and uh, basically a view that uh, this is the seed corn for, uh, for uh, economic growth. We, of course, have some tradition of, of, of programs that we've had, and uh, there have only been six presidents. I'm the sixth, and Mr. Sloan was president for 20 years, so there, there is quite a bit of history there. I talked to outside experts and former grantees about what they thought about our mission and our programs, to our trustees, uh, to the staff. Uh, it became very clear to me that uh, we had to recognize resource limits, that uh, not strange to me as an economist, we were making decisions with a budget constraint, and the budget wasn't all that large, so we had to focus uh, on a relatively small number of things and, and, and try to uh, be catalytic, identify white space where, where we could make a difference uh, and have, a, uh, and have a, uh, an impact. I'll skip on that. The next one got in, I'll skip that. So what did I do when I came in? I had six months between the time I agreed to be president and the time I took over. And I used those six months to study uh, the programs the Sloan Foundation had, to talk to the staff, uh, to talk to many outside people about their, their uh, views on the programs. The one thing I'll tell you is once you become a foundation president, no one says anything bad about anything you do. They laugh at your jokes. They, they, they think you're wonderful. All your programs are wonderful. Everything's wonderful. So it was actually a really good opportunity to get some really straightforward, straightforward views. So, uh, <laughs> honest views. So a number of programs were concluded or restructured. Uh, and uh, 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 I made the decisions on this by the trustees meeting in December 2008. <coughs> when we moved, I found actually the, uh, the, the uh, book I gave the trustees of what we were going to be doing for the next several years. We had an industry studies program. Uh, uh, it had run its course. It was closed. We, ALN stands for Asynchronous Learning Networks. That basically was an online education program, which I think was very far, far-sighted and innovative, but uh, I, I think had, had, had run astray and uh, had, had uh, uh, done all it could do. And a number of the trustees thought that uh, we had done enough uh, in that particular perspective. Uh, a Working Families and Workplace Flexibility Program was very successful. It focused on work-life balance. It focused. Uh, uh, a lot on, on uh, uh, the, the benefits of costs and challenges of providing uh, flexibility in the workplace so that, that people could spend more time with their families. Uh, we spent 15 years on that. It seemed like a lot, and we, we brought it to a, to a uh, gentle conclusion. Uh, we had a biosecurity program that grew out of uh, the events of 9-11, uh, very focused on New York and other areas. Again, I think we'd run, our, run its course. Uh, we had a pro science program called the Census of Marine Life that actually had a 10-year life. Uh, and at the end of 10 years, it was over. Uh, it was a good program, but it had achieved its, its goals. Uh, and uh, uh, although there were people who wanted us to continue it forever, I decided that uh, uh, it had done what it was supposed to do. Similarly, a barcode of life program that focuses on, on on uh, using short DNA sequences to distinguish between species, had really become institutionalized. The Canadians were putting a lot of money into it. Uh, there was a big barcode library that you could draw on it, and it, it uh, again, came to a natural conclusion. Uh, we had a professional science master's program. This is for students interested in science, but didn't want to go on and get PhDs and, and do research, but wanted to be involved in science. They might be lab directors, uh, they, they might become administrators in, uh, in pharmaceutical companies, uh, associated in, in the, the research division and so on. This program we did a little bit differently. It had sort of been limping along for a while without much attention. And what I decided to, I said, look, this is, we had an outside review of the program, very good reviews. Let's put more money into this. Let's set a goal for, for expanding the number of programs. Let's do it for five years. And it's either going to sink or swim. And if it sinks, that's life. Some things sink. If it swims, it'll swim. And it swam. 
uh, it's, uh, and you can actually see it in the data, the elbow when we put in the money and uh, the, it's slowed down now that we're not putting in money, but it's continuing to grow and there are over 325 of those programs now in the, uh, in the country. Our civic program, you know, we're in New York City, our employees live in and around New York City. The foundation's always given some money to, uh, to, to activities in the city, but, but it was kind of unstructured. Uh, and so I restructured that, and it follows our mission statement. It focuses on uh, science uh, and technology, primarily some economics. We've done some work with the city on uh, economic development issues. But we've done things like the DNA Learning Center with Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory to bring uh, modern science to primarily to underrepresented groups in, uh, in high schools in New York. Uh, we helped to fund a, a new genome center uh, in, uh, in the city. And we, we, we've started a number of programs uh, uh, for, uh, uh, special, for, for students who are gifted but are, don't have the advantages or the resources to enter gifted programs uh, in mathematics uh, and in, in science using the universities in the area. Uh, and our universal, uh, our, our, so our, our civic program now looks more like our other programs except the, it has a, a, high school, uh, a high school component. We view that as a pilot, these are pilot programs that other people can adopt in other cities. Then we had programs I decided to continue, of course along with my trustees. Uh, Sloan Research Fellowship Program, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, excellent programs. Uh, we, continue, we, we, we expanded both of them. The Public Understanding Program, uh, our, our public outreach program, we, I expanded. Uh, the STEM Higher Education Program, that is the program for underrepresented groups, we, we've completely restructured. That's taken some time. Uh, this was a program that was well-intentioned, but it was bad. Uh, in the sense that it was too spread out. Uh, the schools involved did not have a, the 33 schools that had one or two or three, and when, when the faculty member retired, the program disappeared. Uh, we've, we've restructured that. We're, we're not quite completed with the restructuring. We'll have three, uh, 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 three to six main, uh, main locations, and it's gonna focus, and, and the schools have to put in their own money. Uh, along with our money to, uh, to show that they're, uh, that they're committed to it. And we started, we, we, we integrated the Universal Access to Knowledge program into, in, into the, the new Digital Information Technology program. In terms of new programs, economics, it was the time. Uh, the aging workforce, I think it was the time as well. Digital Information Technology, it was the time, and we're, we're very focused on our constituency, which is uh, 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 researchers that colleges, universities, and research centers. Uh, the work on deep carbon uh, was very focused on, on not only, under, uh, we know more about carbon in the atmosphere and in the ocean than we do in, in the earth, but more importantly, this was an opportunity to have a multidisciplinary program, to get biologists, physicists, uh, geoscientists uh, of various kinds uh, together uh, working on, on uh, uh, an area that, that had not been uh, well developed from a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, microbiology, the built environment. Uh, we know an awful lot about, about uh, pollutants in the air. We know very little about, about both the good and the bad, about, about uh, microbes and fungi and others that are uh, in, inside. And energy in the environment was my interest and uh, I think it's important and we, we're evolving that into a program uh, as well. So how do we do these programs? And here I think we, we are somewhat unique uh, I started to have an annual strategy offsite where we bring in people, just thinkers in new areas to talk to us about what's going on uh, because we don't, oops, sorry. There you go. I don't think I know everything uh, and neither of my program, so getting new people in is important. Every program has an external advisory committee now for the same reason. Uh, uh, that they, they meet, it, it varies from program to program in terms of the program director, but they meet at least once a year. Uh, all programs are subject to external evaluations. Uh, we're, I'm going back tomorrow. We have a meeting on one of the external evaluations. Uh, all grants, actually that should be $20,000, are reviewed by the entire senior staff. One of the things I tried, when you're a small foundation, you have some disadvantages, but I've tried to get people to work together. Most foundations, are very siloed. 
Uh, and we've looked for opportunities to work across programs, and we all read all the, all the, all the proposals over $125,000, over, over $20,000, and we get external reviews for all proposals over $125,000. So it's like NSF uh, or NIH reviews. I read every single proposal that either goes to the trustees for approval or, or gets funded if it's, uh, if it's uh, uh, under $125,000. All of our grants have written goals and performance metrics, uh, and substantive and financial reports are required. And this is, I, I think, a, a, a more aggressive governance arrangement and quality control arrangement than, than, than many foundations have for their programs. Turn out of people. This was the hardest thing for me. Uh, you know, you're at a university and you, you, you don't like your, your assistant, and you, you call someone and say, I don't like my assistant. And, the assistant disappears and someone else appears. Uh, but I, I really felt that we, we had to reshape the staff to modernize it and to, to, to make it, uh, uh, to, to make it uh, uh, more productive in terms of realizing our, our ambitions. So when I started, we had 30 staff. We now have 30 staff, and we've had a 30-person turnover. Uh, uh, that, that some people have turned over more than once. Uh, but the senior program staff, the program director, we had eight, four retired, one was moved into a management position, and four new people have been hired. We had no juniors, we had program directors who, who were in charge of programs, and then there was no one under them. So uh, I took a page from McKinsey, really, and, and we now have positions where you, we hire people out, out of college for two to three years, with the expectation they'll go back to graduate school or business school or medical school or something like that. Uh, and that has an advantage both of, of bringing more expertise in, but also bring some youth into the, continuously into the, uh, into the uh, program with new ideas and, and, and new activities. Uh, senior management, uh, that's mostly changed. The investment staff, only the chief investment officer is left. The support staff, I would say that Sloan, when I came there, it was, it was kind of antique in that, in, in a sense, and was charming. Uh, everybody has, every program director had his or her own, own secretary that would get you coffee, and, uh, and that, at MIT, we, I shared a secretary with four people, uh, and I did everything myself. I typed my own papers, I Xerox things, I, you, you don't write letters anymore, mostly, you send people emails. So we restructured the staff, we, I share, I share an assistant. I don't have my own secretary. Uh, and, uh, uh, we f and, and we had no IT staff, so we, we, we've, we've strengthened in, in IT, uh, and we've also increased the educational requirements for all of our staff. So our entire staff has at least a bachelor's degree, uh, and all of our program directors except one has a PhD. Uh, you need legal counsel. We're too small to have our own general counsel, and there are a lot of legal issues that come up. Uh, so one of the first things I did, uh, for reasons I'll discuss in a moment, was call our uh, our outside lawyer, who was a, a partner at a very distinguished New York law firm, and she came over and she told me she'd retired. And I said, oh, that's nice. Uh, no one told me <laughs> that. Uh, can you help us find a, do you have another partner? And she said, well, we don't actually do nonprofits anymore. Uh, this law firm was Mr. Sloan's law firm. But I happen to know the, the senior partner, the managing partner, and he helped us do a search, and we, we now have good outside counsel. Uh, and we also changed auditors, which everyone tells you you should never do, but uh, I, I thought we, needed we could get better auditing services uh, from a smaller firm than we were relying on, so we replaced them as a lot. So there was a lot of change that took place over the first two years in people, uh, in, uh, in management, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And uh, in terms of senior management, the sort of the small business part of the job, I hired a new chief financial officer, is also the chief operating officer, a new director of grants management, and new staff support for that. I and mean, we are spending you know, $80 million on grants each year. We ought to be able to, to uh, 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 manage that effectively and budget it and so on. We had no HR person. Uh, even with 30 people, you need an HR person. So we, I turned one of the program directors into an HR person. Uh, we have a new group. We had no, there may have been a grants budgeting system, but no one ever told me about it. We have a new grants budgeting system, which I basically developed. And it's kind of complicated. You, 
we have a model that forecasts different forecasts of how our endowment's going to do and what the IRS rules are. And uh, we make multi-year grants, so you have to make sure you don't give it all away now, and then you can't give anything away three years from now. Uh, so we now have a very good system. As I said, we've added IT uh, capabilities. Uh, we've man I, I think we've focused on managing expenses. Uh, uh, we're a small foundation, my, uh, but we try to keep our expenses as low as we can, consistent with providing the services we need. So I mentioned healthcare. I was shocked. Uh, I looked at the cost of my, my wife and I got health insurance in the Sun Foundation was $43,000 a year. That seemed, even for New York, that seemed excessive. Uh, so we, we looked at that. We've, uh, uh, when we moved, we reduced our rent. Uh, we have a travel policy now. Uh, we try to increase staff efficiency and get everyone to recognize that every dollar we spend on management expenses is a dollar we can't give for grants. And I think that ethos has come through. And then business continuity is, is really something I learned from being a corporate director is really very, very important. I mean, especially in New York, they, you know, they, not just 9-11, they've had blackouts, they've all kinds of things. We have a very sophisticated business continuity plan now, which uh, we test. So if, if our internet service goes out, we have, we have a backup service in, in Kansas City that, uh, uh, that kicks in. Uh, if there's another disaster and people can't leave Manhattan Island, uh, we have a place for everybody to stay uh, in someone's apartment who lives in, uh, who lives in Manhattan. If we can't leave the building, uh, we have meals ready to eat and water uh, uh, in bottles. We, we uh, uh, really try to be prepared. Now, this was a slide I had to get permission to show, so, uh, because all the numbers aren't public. Uh, I started there. So started all this where? stuff, right up there. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. So that's oh, the man. day I started. That was the value of the endowment. Well, then we have the financial crisis. <laughs> so by, I'd been there 15 months, and suddenly our endowment's 30% lower than it was when I started. So all this had to be done with the challenge of uh, uncertain and ever-changing uh, 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 source of funds, uh, which we were able to manage through with, I, I, I think, with a lot of help from our grantees. Uh, as well as a lot of work by the staff. And during that period of time, we managed to give away uh, about $500 million and spent about $50 million in, uh, in uh, IRS allowable uh, expenses. But this is uh, certainly part of the job I didn't expect. If you thought, you know, I, I agreed to do this in June 2007 when the trees were growing to the sky, and I thought my biggest challenge was, how am I going to spend all this money? That turned out not to be the challenge. The challenge was, how do I take uh, a, 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 shrinking, a shrinking budget and use it, uh, and use it uh, uh, as effectively as I can. Okay, governance. I'll conclude with that. So we found, when we moved, we found lots of stuff when we moved. Uh, when we, and we just put this in our annual report. We found this in a 1939 annual report. So this is soon after the foundation was started. And Mr. Sloan was very big on good governance. Uh, and the recognition that, that, that a foundation was for the, a private fund for the public benefit. Uh, and unlike some family foundations, uh, he, start, he had trustees, he, 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 he had outside advisors, he did all of these things. And governance is important to me, and uh, I think it's, it, it's underestimated its importance in a number of foundations. I don't view my trustees as being my enemy. I've, you know, they can fire me, uh, but I view them as being people I can draw on for, uh, uh, for, for advice. And luckily, uh, I got to, I've gotten to participate uh, in the appointment of, uh, uh, of, of uh, most of our trustees. Uh, there are only two of the ex remaining trustees who, who were there uh, before I started. And you can see from the, from the whoops. You can see from the list, these are, so Cindy Barnard's an engineer, Bonnie Bassler is a distinguished uh, molecular biologist, uh, Rich Bernstein was, was an economist, he was uh, the, the chief of uh, strategy at Merrill Lynch, uh, Kevin Burke was the CEO of Con Edison, Mary Schmidt Campbell is the dean of the Tisch School for the Arts, we, we do a lot of stuff uh, uh, in media and arts. 
Fritz Henderson was actually the chairman and CEO of General Motors. Uh, and for long periods of time, the chairman of GM was on the board of the Sloan Foundation, but that's not how he got picked. Uh, we picked him when he was the chief financial officer of GM because he'd, 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 uh, uh, he was smart and he'd worked in many different countries and had an appreciation for different uh, activities and we've, we've kept him on the board. We have a big program for uh, training uh, underrepresented groups. Uh, I got Freeman Rabowski to, from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, one of the country's experts on, on uh, uh, teaching uh, minorities in college, getting to, to graduate school to be on our board. Uh, Bob Litterman is a, uh, is a former, former Goldman Sachs partner, an economist, an expert in time series econometrics, but a climate change fanatic. Uh, and uh, uh, very good. Sandy Moose was a, very good, a, a, a uh, partner at Boston Consulting Group and very helpful on management. Jim Paterba is an economist, a former colleague, and the president of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, and uh, Michael Peruginen is the Dean at, uh, of Science at NYU, uh, and Marta Tienda is a, a social scientist at, at uh, Princeton, and, and we'll be appointing another uh, trustee uh, in December who has expertise in, in data science to try to fill this out. So I can use the trustees when I have questions to uh, ask, and, and they're tough on me. I mean, they get, see the grants, and is this new? Is this, uh, uh, is this really on the frontier? And uh, I find that to be, uh, to be very helpful. So another aspect of governance are mundane things like uh, we need bylaws. Uh, our bylaws, when I read them, they'd been written in 1934. Uh, they, were, they were, if you're interested in in the evolution of American corporations. We were, we were a Delaware corporation. This was a two-tiered entity. We rewrote the bylaws. We, it, we, 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 we modernized them. You no uh, longer two-tiered? Did you change it to two-tiered? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it made no sense anymore. Yeah. Uh, our code of conduct was a paragraph. We, we now have a modern, uh, I think, excellent code of conduct. Uh, we have, we have a whistleblower policy, we have equal employment opportunity and anti-harassment policies. For the first year, and, and here's where other foundations can be helpful, uh, I use the corporate governance documents of the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, uh, the president MacArthur was very, very helpful to me, as was the president of the Hewlett Foundation, the president of the Doris Duke Foundation, and because we didn't have these documents, we just adopted those that I thought were that I thought were good, and after we hired a law firm and we worked them through, we were able to, we were able to make them available. And all these things are available to the public. They're, they're transparent, as are our tax returns, all the grants we make, uh, 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 almost anything you would, uh, you would want to know. And uh, I'm proud of this. It was very hard work, but I think it, it really sets a, uh, sets a standard for, uh, for the conduct of, of foundation employees, uh, for trustees, uh, and uh, 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 I think is it as good or, or better than the best you'll find in the uh, in the the for-profit the for-profit uh, world. And this is something I learned from having contact with the for-profit world as a as a corporate director and as a uh, as a consultant that we really had some had to pull our socks up in this area. Why don't I stop there and take questions? Right.